I want to study with you when Peter confessed Christ. Based in Matthew 16 and verse 16, when Peter said, Thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. I want to study the context of that passage and study verse by verse with you tonight. Let's read in Matthew 16, beginning verse 13. When Jesus came into the coast of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, saying, Whom do men say that I, the Son of Man, am? So in other words, after all of our work and teaching, what feedback do you get? What do they understand so far? They said, Some say, Thou art John the Baptist. Some, Elias, meaning Elijah. Others, Jeremiah, or one of the prophets. The people were so taken with the teaching of Jesus, they imagined he might be one of the great prophets risen from the dead. Now, notice how Jesus will focus the question like a laser directly to the apostles. He saith unto them, but whom say ye that I am? What have you learned? What do you understand? Simon Peter answered and said, Thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. Jesus answered and said unto him, Blessed art thou, Simon Barjona, for flesh and blood hath not revealed it unto thee, but my Father which is in heaven. Meaning the confession you made is the true and the right assessment of who I am. He continued, I say also unto thee that thou art Peter, and upon this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. And I will give unto thee the keys of the kingdom of heaven, and whatsoever thou shalt bind on earth shall be bound in heaven, and whatsoever thou shalt loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. I want to study this passage with you tonight. And notice some lessons we can draw. Notice that Peter confessed the deity of Jesus Christ. Let's think about that. Number two, Christ did not confess Peter. I want to clarify that. And next, did you notice those wrong answers in assessing who Jesus is? Let's pay attention to that. Then notice that Jesus says the confession Peter made is the truth revealed by God the Father. Then Jesus made a great promise that we need to study. I will build my church. But in order to fulfill that promise, he proclaimed, he will conquer death. And then last you noticed how he spoke of the kingdom that would soon be revealed. Let's study the passage then and notice those particular points. Going back now to verse 16. When Peter said, Thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God, he is confessing that you are deity. You are God. You are one of the Godhead. You are divine in nature. Jesus had put forth the question, What do the people understand about me? Who is this Jesus? And he called himself the Son of Man. Now that emphasizes that he shares the same human nature that we have. He got hungry like we do. He got tired like we do. He experienced temptation like we do. He can identify with everything we experience in the flesh. But now he says, what, what do they understand? And then he brought the question directly to the apostles, what do you understand? And Peter said, you are the Christ. The word Christ comes to English from the Greek language. The equivalent word in the Hebrew language, when you come to English, is Messiah. Christ or Messiah means the same thing. But what does it mean? It literally means to anoint someone. You will remember in the history of Israel that when God chose a king, he would send a prophet to anoint that person with olive oil. It was to signify the anointed one is God's chosen king. So when Peter said, you are the Christ, you the anointed one, you are the king chosen and sent by God. And that is correct. And then he added, the 
Son of the living God. Now, if the Son of Man means he shares the human nature we have, then what would the Son of God mean? He shares the same nature of the Father, who is God. He is divine. He is from everlasting to everlasting. He had all power and all knowledge. He is God in the flesh. Fully man, yet fully God. In other words, that confession means you are the promised Savior. We have been waiting all these centuries for the Savior that was promised. Beginning in Genesis 3, the one that will be born of woman to defeat Satan, you are that man. The one promised in Genesis 12, the descendant of Abraham that will bless men of all the nations, you are that man. The one promised in Isaiah 53 who would die for the sins of the world. You are that man. You are the fulfillment of the hope of all the centuries. How true. The promised Savior has come. When Peter says you are the Christ, the Son of the living God, that's a creed, a statement of faith. And it is an all-inclusive creed. It's common that various religions will write out a formal creedal statement trying to summarize what they believe. Well, Peter summarized what he believed. What he believed is Jesus is God in the flesh. Therefore, the word and the teaching of Jesus is the word and the teaching of God, all of it. You are the final absolute standard. That's what he believed. Everything you teach, I should believe. Everything you teach, I should obey. That was his creed. That should be my creed. And your creed. Next, let's notice that Christ did not confess Peter. Now to explain this, I need to go into a little bit of religious history. We'll be doing that some tonight. And I want to alert you from the start. We don't do that to embarrass people. We don't do that to insult anyone. We do that to try to give accurate information, from which information you will make the choice and the decision of what is true. Remember, we have an open forum after the lesson is over. If you were to feel that I misstated something about another religion, please, I sincerely ask you to bring that out in the question period, and we will try to clarify or correct any mistake we make. We're here to study as friends, and this is purely to help us have some accurate information. Now the reason I need to go into this, in the Roman Catholic religion it is taught that in the passage we read tonight, Christ crowned Peter to be the first pope. And that is why the Roman Catholic religion is the one true religion in all the history of the world. And so I need to show you that Christ did not confess Peter. At least give you the information and then you will decide. <laughs> I think you would know the right way to study any passage is get in the flow of the context to try to follow the context. So if we do that, the identity of Jesus is the issue of this passage. Right? Beginning in verse 13 and again in verse 15. There was no issue to clarify who is Peter. Jesus does not ask them, how do you assess Peter? So that is not at the beginning. Now then next in the 16th verse, Peter says, you are the Christ, the Son of the living God. And what did we say Christ means? The anointed one, the chosen king. So Peter is crowning Christ. Christ is not crowning Peter. At least up to that verse. Peter exalted Christ, he elevated Christ, he honored Christ, rather than Christ elevating Peter. Okay? Does that seem right in the context? In the 17th verse, Jesus endorsed that confession by saying it is the truth revealed by the Father. So it was the truth about Jesus that was the issue here, and not the truth about Peter. All right, now going to the 18th verse. In the Catholic religion, they have someone who takes special training to defend the Catholic religion, and he is called a defender. And there's nothing wrong with that kind of work. If we believe something, we should be able to defend it. 
So anyway, the Catholic defender will give you this explanation. Thou art Peter, but the word Peter means a rock. Upon this rock, I will build my church. So the necessary conclusion is, Jesus did crown Peter and elevate him as the first pope because upon this rock, and the word Peter means a rock. And that sounds like a very reasonable explanation. But now, as you know in language, sometimes there are multiple words, we say synonyms, that have a similar meaning, but each one has a more precise meaning. A vehicle is a conveyance of some kind. Now, an automobile is a synonym, but automobile indicates the vehicle moves itself. So there is a significant difference. Now, in this case, yes, Peter means rock, but it means a mere pebble. And when Jesus said, upon this rock, he changed it to another word that also means rock, but it means a great foundation of rock. We don't have to be Greek scholars, but I'm just going to show you something from a Greek to English dictionary, <coughs> the two terms for rock. Thou art Peter. The word Peter is Petros, P-E-T-R-O-S in the Greek language. From Vines Expository Dictionary of New Testament Words, it means, quote, a stone that might be thrown. All of us, when we were children, picked up rocks and threw it in the water to watch the ripple. <coughs> Peter, you are merely a man. That's what he's saying. He's not saying, I'm here to elevate you, but you are an ordinary man like any man, and yet being but a man, you made the great confession that I am the Son of God. And upon this rock, now he used a different word. P-E-T-R-A, Petra. And from that same Greek to English dictionary, it means, quote, a mass of rock. So it is not a point of identity that Peter is the rock, the foundation, the first pope upon which the church will be built. It's a contrast. Peter, you are a mere stone. Yet being only a man, you made the great confession, which is like the rock of Gibraltar, that I am the Son of God, meaning I am the Savior of the world. So it is complimentary toward Peter, but not in any sense that would elevate Peter. A mere man confessed the great truth about our great Savior. And upon that great truth that was confessed, our salvation depends. Now, in fairness, let's go to some other passages to see if the Bible supports this conclusion that I've given you, or would it indicate something different. 1 Corinthians 3.11 is using the figure now of a temple being built. <laughs> the church of Christ is a spiritual temple. For all the foundation can no man lay than that is laid, which is Jesus Christ. Now that's exactly parallel to Matthew 16, 18. Upon this rock, this great rock, this foundation stone, this mountain of rock that I am the Savior, this indestructible rock is your salvation. And that's what 1 Corinthians 3, 11 says. Only Christ is that foundation. And something else, just to help us try to get to the right conclusion about all of this. If Peter was crowned in the presence of the apostles, will the other apostles know and remember that? Why, it would be one of the most significant events they have ever witnessed. If Jesus chose one of them and said, I elevate you to be the first hope, they will not forget that. It will be burned into their memory. But I want to show you again in full of context that other disciples do not know that Peter was a pope. Because we were studying in chapter 16. Just two chapters later, chapter 18, verse 1, the apostles raised the question, who is the greatest in the kingdom of God? If Peter had been crowned pope, there's no reason to ask that question. Peter is already elevated. He is the greatest. All right, but now that, that question and actually a dispute among the apostles continued to happen from time to time. 
And in Matthew 20, verse 21, the mother of James and John approached Jesus and said, Grant my request to elevate my sons so they will be the greatest, one on the right and one on the left in your kingdom. She would not make that request if Peter has already been elevated. So the other disciples are not aware that Jesus has been crowned as the Pope. Now another evidence about it, Peter is not even aware of it. I'm very sure that Peter will be aware of it if he was crowned. And here's one of the reasons, among several, that I'll show you, that I know Peter was not aware of being a Pope. In Acts 10, God sent Peter to the house of Cornelius, a Gentile, to preach the gospel to him. And whereas sometimes we run into resistance, and so did Peter. But sometimes people appreciate hearing the truth. And when Peter came to the house, this man's heart was so ready, so open, and his heart was so full of thanksgiving that Peter came to teach him the truth, he fell down at his feet, Acts 10, 25, and worshipped him. Peter took him up saying, Stand up, I myself also am a man. He's rebuking him. <coughs> Do not bow to me. I am no different than you. But you're looking on the screen at pictures <coughs> of people bowing to the Pope and prostrating themselves on the ground before the Pope, and he did not rebuke them the way Peter rebuked. Peter will not accept such honor from men. He does not regard himself as a Pope. Now furthermore, can anybody remember tonight, what is the name of the current Pope's wife? Anybody happen to remember her name? No one? Because she's not married, right? If he got a wife, they would dethrone him. But Peter was married. In Matthew 8, 14 to 15, his wife's mother was sick, and Peter went to the house and healed her. <coughs> Peter is married. He doesn't qualify to be a pope. Now again, in all fairness, let's hear both sides. The Catholic defender will answer. You are correct in that passage. But remember, that's Matthew 8. In what chapter does Christ supposedly elevate Peter? Chapter 16. So their explanation is the wife had already died. So he did not have a wife. Well, on the surface, that sounds reasonable, at least possibly. But here's why we know that's not an accurate explanation. Thirty years later, the Apostle Paul wrote to the church at Corinth in 1 Corinthians 9, verse 5. Have we not power, meaning don't we have the right to read about a sister, a wife, we have a right to be married, as well as the other apostles, and as the brethren of the Lord, the brothers of Jesus were married, and for some reason he specified one of the apostles, he said, and Cephas. Cephas is another name for what man? It's another name for Peter. So he affirmed 30 years later that Peter still has his wife. So Peter is a married man. He would not qualify to be the Pope. So it is important that we make that clarification because not only actually in Catholic theology, but in many denominational reference books, they give that same explanation. And you may encounter that if you use Bible dictionaries or maybe commentaries, and it's okay to use those books. But those books are not always 100% accurate. And you may encounter this issue. All right, let's take another step in our study. When Peter confessed Christ, there were wrong answers given in assessing who Jesus is. They said, some say that thou art John the Baptist, and some, Elijah, and others, Jeremiah, are one of the prophets. Let's reflect for a moment. Why would the people assess Jesus in that light? They heard his preaching, but that generation heard the preaching of John the Baptist. And they knew how bold and direct the preaching of John was. 
Does anybody remember when John was allowed to preach to Herod? What was his subject? Adultery. And he said, Sir, you have no right to the woman you're married to. He came straight and direct to the point. He didn't do that to embarrass Herod and Herodias. He did that to try to save their souls, to get them to repent. But they were offended. And the wife, especially, was angered so that she maneuvered to get the head of John on a platter. You would remember that. But now here's my point. When people heard Jesus preach, do you know who they thought of? They didn't think of some quiet philosopher that went around giving neutral lectures. They thought of John. This is John the Baptist back from the dead. He's preaching like John did. He goes straight to the point. He doesn't avoid the sins and the false religious teaching of people. He comes straight to the point. That's how Jesus preached. Love my would some think of Elijah. The great thing that the Jewish historians remembered about Elijah is his debates. He faced 400 false prophets at once. I've had a few debates in my life, but I never tried to stand with 400 opponents. He did that. He did that. So think of the courage of a man that would do that. But now why would they identify Jesus in the light of Elijah? Reading the New Testament, you'll find Jesus debating the Pharisees, the Sadducees, the lawyers, the scribes, the Herodians. As every false representative came before him, they challenged him or he challenged them. And so he was a courageous debater just like Elijah. And by the way, we should be learning something as we think and analyze all of that. What kind of preaching and what kind of stance does God want faithful preachers and churches to take today? All right, go ahead, though, Jeremiah. Jeremiah had the boldness and the courage, but he had a tender spot in his heart. He said, when I look at the sins of God's people and how it will bring them to destruction, my eyes flow with tears like a river. And did you know Jesus had that same tenderness? At the close of the most stinging sermon Jesus ever preached, Matthew 23, he said something similar. He said, how often I would have gathered you under my wings as the chicken gathers the little chicks. I can see a tear in his eye when he said that. That had a tender touch to it. Because even though Jesus is exposing sin to bring people to repent, he loves them and he wants that to be clear. They saw that in Jesus. Or one of the other prophets. So it makes a good study in understanding how Jesus preached when you think about what came to the minds of the people who heard him preach. All right, now there are wrong answers today. And just like those were meant to be complimentary, even the wrong answers today are meant to be complimentary. Jewish scholars say that Jesus was a great teacher. Did you know they acknowledge that? And I've even had personal studies and discussions with uh, Jewish people who would say we admire Jesus. He was truly a great teacher. But as I asked one of them, does a great teacher tell lies? And the man agreed, no, no, a great teacher won't do that. Well, I said, Jesus said before Abraham was, I am. He affirmed himself as God. Man, close the discussion. He didn't make another comment. Jesus is not only a great teacher, though he is a great teacher. The only true assessment is you are the Christ, the Son of the living God. Now, in the Buddhist religion, which, by the way, is becoming more prevalent in our nation, recently a large new Buddhist temple was opened in the Louisville, Kentucky area where I live. Buddha teaches that Buddha was a light, you can be a light the same as Buddha, and they endorse that Jesus was also the light. But what they're saying is, Jesus is the light on the same level as every person. They say Buddha was especially the light of the East. But of course you may be thinking of the same verse I'm thinking of, when Jesus said, I am the light of the world. The North, the East, the West, the South, all of it. We can reflect the light of Christ, but we are not the same light as he was. And so this answer that Buddha gave is wrong. 
The only true assessment is, Thou art the Christ, the one and only, the Son of the living God. Hindu is also becoming stronger in our nation, and of course it's all around the world. The Hindu religion does believe Jesus was God. And even when we preach in India, Brother Bill Beasley has done a good bit of preaching in India, and I have other close friends who have, and they say you can easily baptize people, because if you preach Jesus is God, they believe that and they'll be baptized. But how do they understand Jesus is God? In the Hindu religion, they say there are 330 million gods. The Ganges River is a god. And to honor this God, there are women who throw their babies to the river. Utterly sincere in what they believe and practice. <clears throat> but did Peter say to Jesus, You are one of the sons of the living God, and there are 330 million of them. That's not what he confessed. You are the Christ. How many? It means you're the one and the only Christ. The son of the living God. There's not another. And so the Hindu means to compliment Christ, but their answer is not true and accurate. All right, certainly Islam has come to the forefront in recent years, and we may have now neighbors and co workers that are Muslims, and we don't want to insult them either. But we do want to open their minds to study the Word of God. Did you know they say Jesus is a great prophet? And you may use that as a stepping stone to try to begin to teach them. But the point is, they say he was not God, and Muhammad is a greater prophet than Jesus. And that's where you'll have to take issue with them and try to get them to study with you. And by the way, if you'll make that effort, they do believe that the Bible came from God. So you don't have to go to the book of the Quran they use. You can go to your Bible and try to teach them. But that's a wrong answer, that he's a prophet, but that he's not God. The Jehovah's Witnesses are very zealous. We can admire and appreciate their zeal. I have had personal friends who are Jehovah's Witnesses. But in their teaching, Jesus is not God with a capital G. If you have one of their Bibles, as I do, they have their own translation. In John 1, 1, it says, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was a God, lowercase g. And if you ask them, well, what does that mean? Well, they say that's a, a title of honor that means Jesus was the head of all the angels. And he was an angel. He was Michael the angel. So I just ask, is that what Peter confessed? Did Peter say, you are the head angel. You are an angel above uh, the other angels. But that's not what he confessed. You are the Christ, the Son of the living God. And that is the true confession. Our culture is permeated with secular humanism. My son David just moved up to Alaska to preach, and he and a young man were canvassing the university there, the University of Alaska, to think what could they do to find some openings to teach the gospel. And the humanist had a booth set up on the campus. So this is being militantly pushed, not only on college campuses, but in our culture. And the secular humanists will say that Jesus was not God, but he was a great philosopher, he was great in teaching ethics, uh, he was a great teacher, he was skillful. They will give him a lot of compliments, but they all fall short. The only true assessment is the confession Peter made. Have I made that confession with all of my heart? And dear friend, if you're ready to make that confession, do not let your husband discourage you, your wife discourage you, your parents discourage you, your children discourage you. If you can make that confession, you're ready to be baptized into Christ. And we'll be inviting you to do that even tonight. Let's notice now Jesus endorsed that confession. It is the truth revealed by the Father in heaven. Verse 17. Blessed art thy Simon bar Jonah, for flesh and blood have not revealed it unto thee, but my Father which is in heaven. That's a way of saying what you spoke conforms to the divine revelation given by God. 
I'm not speculating. This is not a philosophical thing. Not some human theology. It is the divine truth coming from heaven. Notice the difference. If what Peter said is a human speculation coming from flesh and blood, it means it would have human origin. But when he said now, from the Father in heaven, then the confession Peter made is from a divine origin. There's something important Jesus is teaching. There's a concept there. We should be studying and assessing and digging and comparing things to learn in religion what teaching has its origin in humanity and what teaching has its origin in deity. We should be searching for that difference. It's a vital distinction that applies in all religious issues. All right, let's notice next the great promise made by Jesus. In Matthew 16, 18. I will build my church. Let's try to understand what he means by that promise. The word church in our culture actually has several different meanings. And let's try to clarify what did Jesus have in his mind. The first thing again, let's start with upon this rock. Whatever it means that he will build his church, it will be upon the rock of Gibraltar that he is the son of the living God. Our salvation is dependent upon Jesus Christ and not upon any man. But now when he said, I will build my church, the simplest way we can understand that and the most accurate way we can understand it, he is saying, I came to save the souls of men that are lost in sin. That's what he said. I came to bring them out of their sins and bring them into fellowship with God. And he expresses that with the word church for this reason. Now, that was not at that time a religious <laughs> word. It was an ordinary word. If we said everyone from age five down, please come to the front. Did you know that would be a church in the way it was used in those times? It would not have a religious meaning at all. If we said we ask all the men to stand to the right, then that's a church. It means any gathering of people for any reason or purpose. So Jesus is saying, I will gather people. They will be my people. I will save them. And by so doing, they will be in fellowship with God. That is the simple, beautiful, powerful promise that Jesus made and no man can make. No man has such authority. Now, going back to our English grammar, the word church is used to mean a hierarchy. Uh, for instance, the Pope, the Cardinals, the Archbishops, down to the priests, and this is a special religious organization. There are others that think about a denominational president and a board of directors. <laughs> Perhaps they would also have district supervisors and other officers. And so altogether, this makes a hierarchy. And in English grammar, it can be used that way. But I'm saying Jesus was not thinking of that at all. He wasn't going to organize anything like that. He means, I want to save the souls of the lost. In English grammar, we may use the word to mean a cathedral, a physical building. But Jesus was not gathering materials, nor was he drawing a design to make any kind of physical building. I will build my church. Think of what he meant. I'm going to reach out to the lost and save them. Now, in our English grammar, it's very common that we would use the word church to indicate a certain denomination. But again, understand what Jesus is saying. He's not saying, I will gather people into many religious organizations or denominations. All he's saying is, people are lost in their sins, and I'm going to bring them to me to save their souls. Beautiful, simple, powerful promise. The Greek word there is ekklesia. I know you've heard that before. And it means any group of 
people that were called out from one situation or stance to another. It even could be a political context, educational context, any kind of context. But Jesus has in mind for spiritual context, saving sinners. He's going to call them through the gospel. And he first did that for the apostles. And he's still doing that tonight. And when a soul comes to Jesus for salvation, that will constitute his church. The church of Christ. Now having understood that, if Jesus gathers souls, if someone else than Jesus, on some other premise or some other teaching, gather souls, it will be the wrong church. Now again, I pause to say, I'm not using that in some insulting way. I'm trying to help you understand in an accurate way what was Jesus thinking about, what was he talking about when he said, I will build my church. All right, he's just gathering people to himself. So what if Ron Halbrook makes certain doctrinal statements, maybe I organize a group of people, and I gather people. Do you see that's the wrong gathering? It's not the same thing Jesus had in his heart, in his mind, in his purpose, in his plan. Because this human leader cannot bring people into fellowship with God. I don't care how eloquent the man might be or how sincere he might be. He has no power to do that. Jesus is the Christ, the anointed king sent by God to do that. So we need to get it fixed in our minds that no man, no organization can do that. Only Jesus. Now again, I used to teach history. I taught world history. And we cover some of this information when I taught world history. And I wasn't teaching in a religious context, but a history class. So stay with me now, study from a historical perspective. We've studied about what Jesus promised. That was in the first century. 500 years later, in 606, there were people professing to follow Christ. One named Boniface III in the city of Rome proclaimed himself as the universal bishop or the pope. That's the first time in all of history that an organization existed with that official. And from a historical viewpoint now, going back to the Bible times, no such organization, no such group existed. Can you see now? So did Jesus gather souls to save them? Yes. Did Jesus have an organization with a pope? No. So that's a different group. That's a different gathering. Not for the purpose of embarrassing anyone now, but you, I want you simply to study the history of what I'm saying. Now, after about a thousand years, there was actually open rebellion within the Catholic Church. It became very corrupt. And Catholic priests were some of the first ones to protest against the corruption. Martin Luther in Germany in 1520 nailed, he was a Catholic priest, he nailed 95 propositions for debate contradicting the doctrines of the Catholic Church of which he was a member. And the Catholic Church excommunicated him. And thus the beginning of what is now called the Lutheran Church. For 1,500 years, just think history, history. For 1,500 years there was no Lutheran Church on the face of the earth. There was no gathering of people identified in that way. But going back to the Bible, did Christ gather and save souls through his apostles? Yes. So he had his church. But it wasn't the same as the gathering of people into a Lutheran church. All right? Then uh, King Henry VIII was a Catholic, married to Catherine of Aragon, Spanish lady. She bore uh, female infants, but he wanted a male heir. So he asked permission from the Pope to divorce his wife. They call it annulment in the Catholic religion. The Pope would not agree to do that. Catherine had not been unfaithful to her husband. So King Henry VIII said, I know how to solve that. 
I'm going to cut the nation of England off from the Pope, and I will be the head of the church in this country. And if I'm the head of the church, I like the rules. He divorced her and married Anne Boleyn. It's in history. You can search that out. So that's the beginning of what is called the Anglican Church, but in our country, the Episcopal Church. So for 1,500 years, there was no such religion as that. I want you to analyze Jesus had his church, but that it was not the Anglican Church. Uh, in Switzerland, John Calvin laid the groundwork for the Presbyterian Church. In 1607 in Holland, John Smith, the Baptist Church. So for 15 or 1,600 years, there was no Baptist church. But beginning in that year, until about <coughs> time, there are, of course, Baptist churches. 1739 in England, John Wesley broke away from the Anglican church. He thought it was becoming corrupt. So he organized Methodist groups. 1830 in America, Joseph Smith, the Mormons, and coming right down to our time. 1872, Charles Russell organized the Jehovah's Witnesses. 1945, Howard Goss was the first superintendent of the United Pentecostal Church. And so this is just ongoing. So again, now in history, think of it. When you open your Bible, Jesus made a promise that he fulfilled. He built his church. It was through the preaching of the apostles he sent. Now many years after that, other religious groups arose with their distinctive doctrines. Think of it. The Catholic doctrine is different from the Lutheran. That's why there are two different groups. Uh, the Lutheran doctrine is different from the Baptist. That's why they are different groups. So each group is organized with their own doctrines. But Jesus said, I will build my church. And he did. And I want you to know that same church exists today. You read your Bible and search this for yourself. You can be a member in the same church that Jesus established. If you'll search that out. Now in order to fulfill that promise, he must conquer death. He knew he would be put to death. So in verse 18, he also said, The gates of hell shall not prevail against it. In Greek, there is a word Gehenna, meaning the place of eternal punishment. And that will come at the end of time. But when we die, our souls go into a place God prepared called Hades. In Matthew 16, 18, Jesus used that word Hades. So look what he's saying. The gates of hell will not prevail against it, meaning Jesus will pass through the gates of Hades. Now that's clarified in the same context in verse 21. Because he explains to his disciples... The time would come, the chief priests and the scribes will kill him, and then he will be raised again. So when they kill him, his soul goes to Hades. When he is raised again, his soul comes out of Hades. The gates of Hades, death, will not prevent him to build his church, to be our Savior. All right? Notice in Colossians 2.15, he is not defeated by death, having spoiled principalities and powers. He may show them openly, triumphing over them in it. Referring to the cross. The cross did not bring his work to an end. The cross opened the way to heaven through cross. So he had victory and not defeat even in his death. Now, last of all, let's think for just a few moments about the kingdom that he promised and that would be revealed through the apostles. I will give unto thee the keys of the kingdom of heaven. Whatsoever thou shalt bind on earth shall be bound in heaven. Whatsoever thou shalt loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. Notice this. When he speaks of the kingdom of heaven, again, he speaks of the souls he will save. That's why it means the same as the church of Christ. <clears throat> the church of Christ meaning I will gather souls and save them. The kingdom of heaven meaning exactly the same thing. It's just another way to express it. Alright? And then in that verse notice, 
he will give it to Peter, the keys to Peter, and he, Peter will bind and loose. But all of the apostles are included, and that is clarified in Matthew 18, verse 18. They all would utilize the keys that open the way into the kingdom of God. Keys. Not physical, that's a metaphor. The keys, meaning the message they preach. Keys open something. So here's the opening of the gates, the opening of the way into God's kingdom. In other words, how we come to Christ for salvation. It will be done through the preaching of the apostles. Then, what is bind and loose? When your Congress gathers, they make laws. They bind and loose. They clarify things authorized and things not authorized in the government. The apostles will bind and loose. But there's something unique. When they reveal the law of the kingdom, it's not by their own authority <coughs> it was first found in heaven and loosed in heaven. That's an important distinction. The apostles never wrote a creed or a doctrinal statement of any kind except what was revealed directly from heaven and that has been recorded in the New Testament. So the preaching of the apostles opens the way into this kingdom. Now how do people actually enter that kingdom when the apostles preach? Don't have time to analyze the whole chapter, but if you read Acts 2, there's a great sermon on the death and resurrection of Christ. And here is how it concluded in verse 36. Therefore let all the house of Israel know assuredly, know assuredly, that means you're convinced, you believe something, that God hath made Je that same Jesus whom you have crucified, both Lord and Christ. And they were convinced. Because what question did they ask? What must we do? What shall we do? We're ready to submit to that king. Peter said, repent and be baptized every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sin and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. Did you see the gates open? That's how the gates open. And the ga that gate is open for us tonight because the preaching of the apostles opened that gate. In verse 41 it said, They that glad had received his word were baptized. And the same day there were added unto them about 3,000 souls. Pause and think what a glorious response that was to the gospel invitation. Can you imagine 3,000 people being baptized in one day? That's how powerful the gospel is. A few times in the Philippines, I've seen as many as 49 baptized at one time. And some Americans might be skeptical. I don't know if I really think they... Well, were these people sincere? 3,000? So I want you to see how powerful the gospel is when it penetrates honest hearts and it brings us to repent and submit to Christ. And then verse 47 said, The Lord added to the church daily as should be, such as should be so. So look what has happened in that chapter. Here we have Christ and his church, the king and his kingdom. And Peter is preaching to the sinners on the day of Pentecost to open the gates to enter that kingdom of heaven. The gospel is that entrance into that kingdom of heaven. The salvation that Christ gives. When we believe the gospel, repent of our sin, and submit in baptism, we enter that kingdom. It was not baby baptism on that day. Did you notice before baptism what they must do? They must believe and they must repent. And no baby can do that. But no baby is a sinner. And so baby baptism is not part of the gospel of Christ. And then Peter did not bring them into the kingdom by preaching faith only. In the religious denominations today, the most prevalent doctrine is you will be saved by faith only. You'll say a sinner's prayer, maybe you will raise your hand to God, and you just accept Jesus in your heart. And I know there are many sincere people that are teaching about it. But that is not the original gospel of Jesus Christ. 
we can only enter his kingdom by the teaching the apostles gave. Now I need to clarify just a couple of points shortly and I'll end this study. How were those people identified? Does it make sense that if Christ is the foundation of their salvation, that when they submit to him, they are identified by his name? For some reason, that just makes good sense to me. In Acts 11, 26, the disciples were called Christians. The form of that word is Christ, the I-A-N, that's a cultural form, and it means this. If you are a slave, you wear the name of your master with I-A-N after that name. So what does that name mean? We belong to Christ, like a slave belonging to a master. And it makes good sense. He died for us. He is our Savior. In Romans 16, 16, when those Christians gather in local communities, they're called churches of Christ. It just means we belong to Christ. And so God's way is we are identified by the name of our Savior. Man's way has changed that over the centuries. So that when people say they have accepted Christ and been saved, been saved they are assigned human denominational names. And I want you to study that out for yourself and see that's not in the teaching of Christ. Actually, it's contrary to his teaching. In 1 Corinthians 1, some of the Christians at Corinth began to identify them too closely with the names of men. Paul said, I hear some of you saying, I am of Paul, I am of Apollos, I am of Cephas. And Paul asked this question, is Christ divided? How many saviors are there? What did Peter confess? You are the Christ, the Son of the living God. One Savior only. He is not divided. And if we take human names, we're dividing Christ. So to, in that time, the issue was some are saying, I'm a Paulite Christian. Not me, I'm an Apollosite Christian. The other fellow, well, not me, I'm a Cephasite Christian. Do you see the same problem is in our time? Here's several men at the break room, and somebody said, well, I go to church, and I'm a Pentecostal Christian. What about you? No, I'm not a Pentecostal Christian. I'm an Alliance Christian. And next fellow said, well, I'm neither one. I'm a Catholic Christian. And we know people are sincere when they use those expressions. But I want you to see that's not God's way. I want you to search that out in your own Bible. That is not the teaching of Christ. But it does make sense in this way. If men make the religions, men have a right to make the names for their religions. Does that make sense to you? It does to me. So if men form a Roman Catholic religion, men can give it that name. If men form a Presbyterian religion, they can give it that name. They can give it whatever name they want to give it. They made it. But that was not the original teaching of Christ. So then notice this. That kingdom that was revealed was established on Pentecost in the city of Jerusalem in the year 33 A.D. I want to show you how that's helpful to us. Christ had made the promise, I will build my church, I will give you the keys of the kingdom. So here's a promise now he's preparing to fulfill. And he died for us and then arose from the dead, but before he went back to heaven, during those few days he was on the earth, Acts 1, 3 to 4, did you know he continued teaching the apostles about the kingdom? And he said, you wait in Jerusalem. See how close it was to coming? In Acts 1, 6, they even asked him, will you at this time restore the kingdom? Are you going to raise up the kingdom now? He said, just wait. In Jerusalem. And then in Acts 2, we've already mentioned how the apostles began to preach. And the same day there were added unto them about 3,000 souls, and the Lord added to the church daily. When the Lord added to the church, ask yourself, what church did he add them to? Huh? What church did he add them? Did he add them to the Roman Catholic religion? Well, that didn't exist yet. Maybe did he add them to the Jehovah's Witness religion? That did not exist yet. 
these human religions started at the wrong time and the wrong place. You see how that helps us? Presbyterian religion started in 1536, the wrong time, in Switzerland, the wrong place. Because the kingdom of God that Jesus brought began in what city? Jerusalem. In what year? 33 AD. And we want to be a member in that same body today. Last, I want you to know that Christ is the only head of this church. His kingdom has no earthly head and no earthly headquarters. Matthew 28, 18, he said, All authority is given to me in heaven and on earth. Question. If Jesus has all authority in heaven and on earth, how much authority does a pope have on earth? How much authority does the president of a denomination have? Or how much authority does Ron Halbert have? If Christ has all authority, we have no authority. He is the only head in heaven and earth. Ephesians 1.22, the Father put all things under his feet and gave him to be the head over all things to the church. So if Christ is our only head, where is our headquarters? It has to be in heaven. That's right. Because where is Christ tonight? He is in heaven. I encounter this in the Philippines many times, that people are interested in what we're preaching, and they come and say, I am really interested. Where is your headquarters? And I tell them, well, it's, it's in heaven. No, I don't mean that. I mean, where's your headquarters on earth? Well, no, we don't have that. And people are astonished because in our modern culture, we're adjusted to the idea there should be some kind of human headquarters. And we need to remove that from our minds. And we need to understand the reality. Christ is the only Savior and the only head of the church that he built. If our headquarters can be identified on this earth, we're in a man-made church or religion. We're in the wrong church or religion because it was built by man. So I thank you for listening patiently to the study, and I hope you'll go back and review Matthew 16. You have such great lessons when Peter confessed the deity of Christ, and I hope it is clarified that Christ did not confess Peter we saw there were wrong answers. Let's be sure we confess the right answer because it is the truth revealed by the Father. And Jesus then based our salvation upon that great truth when he said, I will build my church. He conquered death in order to do that. How amazing to know that someone has conquered death because I'm marching to my grave and so are you. Someone has conquered death in order that he can be our Savior. And he revealed his kingdom for our salvation. And the gates are open tonight. Is there anyone here that believes that? And you're ready to confess that Jesus is the Son of God just like Peter confessed it. And by repenting of your sins, your heart is prepared. You can be baptized this very night. And the blood of Christ will wash away every spot, every stain, every sin. And we will not assign you a human name, but we will send you with the name of Christ. You belong to Him. You will live for Him. And when He comes again, He's coming for His people, His kingdom. Your home will be in heaven. If you want to lay hold on that hope tonight, we invite you to come forward. If you need to be restored back to your Savior, we invite you to come forward. And please do it now while we stand and sing.